Hi guys, I want to continue today our discussion of reliable transfer protocol or reliable data protocol. So if you recall, um, we were working on defining a reliable data transfer protocol implementation for the sender and receiver such that when the sending process sends some data, uh, the sender implementation does something before forwarding a packet onto unreliable data channel uh, implemented at the network layer and then when the receiver of the reliable data transfer protocol receives a packet they can do some stuff to be able to deliver data uh, in order once and correctly all right so what our transfer protocol wants to provide is this illusion of having a reliable communication channel to the application layer while in fact it has to do all kinds of magic to uh, deal with the fact that the network channel is unreliable so we looked at different implementations of um, uh, the sender and the receiver finite state machines depending on what can happen at the uh, network layer so here we have a we had a situation where there could be errors that happen on the communication channel right? and then to deal with that we had um, the receiver would send acknowledgments or negative acknowledgments depending on whether the, the packet was corrupt based on a checksum like the one we've seen in UDP and based on the kind of reply from the receiver being an acknowledgment or a negative acknowledgment um, the sender would either resend the data or move on to transmission of the next packet so now where we left off is where we want to look at a few other things that can happen at the network layer. So one, it's possible that the acknowledgements or negative acknowledgements are corrupted. So let's say that the receiver gets the packet correct, correctly, it's not corrupted, it sends the acknowledgement, but the acknowledgement itself is corrupted on the way back to the sender. And so now the sender doesn't know if it's an acknowledgement, if it's a negative acknowledgement, if it's something else, uh, and so maybe it proactively resends the data just in case. Um, but now what happens is that the receiver gets a duplicate packet that it already received and acknowledged. And so what does it do? Does it deliver the data again? Well, now it's delivering data twice, which is not correct. Um, so to deal with this issue, we will need sequence numbers. So each packet gets assigned not just a checksum, but a sequence number. And then the receiver can get the sequence number from the received packet, right? Now, it turns out that we only need zeros and ones for the sequence number in this protocol. You can say, why is that? Well, on the previous slide, I mentioned that this is a stop and wait protocol, meaning that we send a packet, we get an acknowledgement, then we send the next packet, then we get an acknowledgement. So in this sort of uh, stop and wait protocol, we really need just one and zero to, this, to determine if a packet is this packet or the other packet, right? And then once we move to the other packet, well, then we have just one other packet behind that, and we can always distinguish between them using ones and zeros, all right? So your task, which should take you a little while to do, is to come up with the uh, finite state machine for the sender and the receiver of this RDT 2.0 um, mechanism using sequence numbers and retransmissions. All right, good time to pause the video. If uh, you've paused and you've uh, come up with your own uh, finite state machine, let's look at the solution. Okay, so this is the sender implementation which will handle uh, garbled acknowledgements okay so let's see what happens well the first thing is that data arrives from the application layer someone called rdt send okay great now we're going to make a packet the sender will make a packet and assign it sequence number zero um, take some take the data that was passed in create a checksum for it and that all creates a packet and now that packet is sent using udp send all right, so now the sender will wait for an acknowledgement or a negative acknowledgement for that particular packet with that particular sequence number, all right? So we will receive a packet. So if a packet is received and the packet is corrupt or 
it's a negative acknowledgement, okay? Meaning we receive the neg a negative acknowledgement from the, uh, from the receiver, or we received something that we don't recognize, the packet was corrupt, okay? We're going to resend the packet. Which packet are we sending? We are resending the packet with sequence number zero, okay? On the other hand, if we receive a packet, it is not corrupt, and we can, based on that, determine that it's an ACK, or we can also determine that it's an ACK, we simply transition to waiting for a call from application. So we're in sort of this symmetric case, except now when we get, now when the sender gets data from the application, it will create a packet with sequence number one. And we're doing basically the same thing as before on the other side of the uh, finite state machine. So for this to make sense, let's look at the receiver um, actions, which are also kind of symmetric, if you look at them that way. Um, and so let's, even though this looks complicated at first glance, let's try to break this down into uh, separate actions. All right. So the first thing that the sender did is sent a packet with uh, sequence number zero. So uh, the receiver is waiting for an action from the network. And um, if the action is that there was a received packet and the packet is not corrupt, okay, um, and we can get the sequence number to be zero, or we verify that the incoming sequence number of the packet is zero, then great, we can extract the data from the packet, we can deliver the data, and we can send a packet, um, which is an acknowledgement, okay, and that also includes a checksum, which allows the sender to then determine if this packet was corrupt or not. All right, and then we call UDT send to send the acknowledgement, all right? And now we kind of wait to see what happens from the network, okay? So, um, right, at this point, basically the, we send some data, okay? And let's say this, so the, the, we send some data, the receiver replied with an ACK, and now we're transitioning to wait for a call from the application layer. Maybe there's another packet to be transmitted, now we're gonna send it with sequence number one. But let's see what happens on the receiver side. Okay. All right, so we sent an acknowledgement, and now a few things can happen, all right? We can receive a next packet, all right? And that packet can be corrupt. Okay, great, so if it's corrupt, we're just going to send a negative acknowledgement again, right? So we don't know what came in, we're just gonna say, we don't know what it was, here's a negative acknowledgement. So what could have been sent is after we send the packet, okay, it could be that the receiver sent us an acknowledgement, but it was corrupt, and so we simply resend the packet. So if the packet was resent, okay, if it was corrupt, there's going to be another negative acknowledgement, okay? If the packet was resent, it was not corrupt, and the sequence number was zero, which is the same thing as here, we're just going to resend the acknowledgement. Okay? Now, when the acknowledgement is finally received by the sender, okay, then the sender sends a packet with sequence number one, and now we're on the receiver on the symmetric side of the transition diagram looking for, for packet with sequence number one. Right. So to really get this up, the operation of these two diagrams, it's good to match them up side by side and kind of trace through the different options that can happen. All right. um, so one thing to, two things to keep in mind, I guess. One is that when we receive packet with sequence number zero, we only deliver it once. And packet with sequence number one only gets delivered once here. Right? So each packet with the sequence number, I guess, until we recycle, only gets delivered once. We can receive that packet again here, but now we know that this packet already has been delivered, and so if we receive a packet with sequence number zero again, we're simply going to send an acknowledgement uh, back, but not do the data delivery part. Okay? So this is basically the, the loop on duplicates where as long as we keep receiving packets with sequence number zero, we're just going to keep sending acknowledgements back. All right, so uh, what more can happen to this, you can ask? Well, um, 
we can also assume that uh, packets can be lost in the network, not just corrupted, but simply lost. And um, then we need to come up with another state transition diagram. You can kind of read about it more in the book here. It's got more details. But what it deals with is uh, we need to be able to detect that a loss has occurred. Um, and then what can we do about it, right? So um, when we're waiting for something and it hasn't arrived in a while, we'll probably get interested, look at the tracking numbers, see where is the package from Amazon, right? But there is a general some timeout under which we're kind of okay, things are getting there, and then when the timeout is exceeded, then we say, okay, where is my stuff, right? And so this is basically what, they receive, what the sender will do. So the sender will wait for a reasonable time to receive an acknowledgement, and if the acknowledgement has been lost, well, then we're going to retransmit the packet, right? Now, there are some challenges with that, which I'll show you in a second, right? So for example, um, what if the packet or acknowledgement has only been delayed? Um, can we still retransmit the packet? Well, we should be able to deal with it with duplicate sequence numbers, right? We should be able to detect that. Um, and so we're basically going to use sequence numbers as before, but now there's going to be this timeout event added to waiting for acknowledgements. Instead of going through this diagram, let me show you what happens with the different values of, of the timeout. So let's say here that we have the sender and the receiver and the time axis which goes from top to bottom. You can see the sequence of events that happen. First, the sender sends packet zero. Okay, that packet zero is received by the receiver and the receiver sends an acknowledgement zero. When the sender gets the acknowledgement zero, now it knows it can send packet one and so on and so forth. Eventually, packet one is acknowledged with act one and now the sender can restart the sequence number and set packet zero and receive act zero, etc., etc. All right, now let's say that this packet one is lost, All right? So what happens? Well, we get the acknowledgement zero, we send packet one, there is no acknowledgement, we don't know if the acknowledgement got lost or if the packet got lost on the way to the receiver. Well, I guess in this case, we do know it's the packet one that got lost, but in this case, there's going to be no acknowledgement for the packet. And so after some timeout, the sender simply decides to retransmit packet one and then it gets the acknowledgement and then it starts moving to um, uh, sending packet zero again or, in, or a, a new packet under sequence number zero. Okay. Another option, as I mentioned, is that the acknowledgements could be lost. So we send packet one, it has been received by the receiver, the acknowledgement got lost, after a timeout, the sender retransmit the same packet one, okay? But now the receiver can detect this packet one as a duplicate, not deliver it to the application layer, but still, again, reply with acknowledgement one, which allows the sender to move on to um, to cycle the sequence number to packet zero. The final thing that can happen though is a premature timeout. So the sender sends packet one, there is an acknowledgement coming back, but the sender didn't judge this time appropriately. And so it thinks, the sender thinks that it's maybe in this case or the case where the packet got lost and proactively retransmit packet one, All right? All right, now we have things kind of crossing each other. So what happens? Well, the first packet one gets here and there's an acknowledgement being generated. Before this acknowledgement arrives, the sender times out and sends packet one. Okay, great. So the acknowledgement, the first acknowledgement gets here to sender and now the sender sends packet zero. Okay, but when the second packet one gets to the receiver, the receiver says, okay, great. I don't know, maybe my acknowledgement got lost. I seem to be getting a retransmission. I'm going to detect a duplicate, but still send act one back. All right. The sender now sent packet zero gets acknowledgement one back, but can simply ignore it because what it's waiting for is acknowledgement zero. All right. So this is how timeouts work. There's always a bit of a question of do we use a long timeout? Do we use a short timeout? If we use a short timeout, there will be premature retransmissions. If we use long timeouts, maybe we're going to have to wait for a long time for this transmission to resume. So I'll show you guys later how to kind of, uh, how TCP chooses the appropriate timeout and why it does it that way. 
All right. So that's the discussion for RDT, which is fun. So what? Uh, it's fun because now I can discuss the next programming assignment with you guys on Wednesday, which will be the implementation of RDT. Uh, the nice thing about this assignment is that uh, one, we've run this before, so uh, I have a rough idea of how it's going to go. Um, and also you get lots and lots of starting code. So that should make your job a little bit easier. There's going to be much less looking up of, of packages as opposed to the first assignment. All right. Thank you guys.